Hello, everybody. You know, this is an absolutely crazy time that we're living in. What we don't have is intelligent conversations uh, from all sides of the aisle. The politicians are not listening. The folks in the cities are not listening. And it's all around energy. And I've got a special guest today. I have got Ronald Stein, who wrote a book with Todd Royal, Clean Energy Exploitations, Helping Citizens Understand the Environmental and Humanity Abuses that Support Clean Energy. I'll tell you what, this is another uh, one of several interviews that I've had with uh, Ronald, and I absolutely enjoy every conversation. Sit back and enjoy some of his newest material and welcome Ronald for stopping by. Stu, glad to be aboard. I'll tell you what, I thoroughly enjoy our conversations, and I even love it when I'm sitting back in the stands heckling you uh, on live podcasts with like Armando or those, and you're speaking with Armando uh, again soon, aren't you? Thursday, yes. Uh, he's a cool guy out of Brazil. I absolutely <laughs> love him. And um, one of the things you, that caught my eye this week was uh, your article, Global Elites Have No Master Plan to Replace Crude Oil Other Than Lining Their Wallets. Boy, you're bringing up a big one with that headline. <laughs> Reality is uh, hitting the fan. Huh? <laughs> oh, you bet. What were you thinking on this? Well, it's, it's amazing that they, they give all these incentives to, to do something that they might be invested in but they're not solving the problem that they want to solve. They, still, the elephant in the room is that no one wants to discuss the fact that crude oil is a foundation of our materialistic society. Right. You know, the world populated from one to eight billion people in 200 years, not because of oil. Right. Because oil by itself is useless. It's black tar. Unless you can refine it, you know, beat it and heat it and crack it and all that good stuff. Right. And through human ingenuity, we've been able to get a lot of oil derivatives out of that black, cruddy stuff and make 6,000 products in our daily lives that didn't exist 200 years ago. So it's not that the world populated from 1 to 8 billion because of oil. It's because of the products. We're a product-driven society. And you know, wind and solar only generate electricity. You, you've made those comments and on, uh, on LinkedIn or Substack and things. And I absolutely love the way that you're actually going, hey, you can't make an iPhone out of a windmill. It does not work that way. And so I always enjoy you bringing that and say, hey, look, you got to have oil in order to make plastics. You got to have it. And um, at this point, uh, Mr. Producer, if you'd make a note, we want to put in a bring in a slide of life without oil, not as simple as you may think. So with that, it it is a great chart, Ronald. I know you've probably seen it. You've got 46 percent of all oil goes to making gasoline. But what makes up the other 54 percent? We've got medicine, cosmetics, plastic. Uh, synthetic rubber, cleaning products, asphalt, and then a whole list of a bazillion other things. Exactly. Yeah, because, you know, today we have, you know, transportation infrastructures. We got airports, hospitals, medical equipment, appliances, electronics, telecommunication. This didn't exist 200 years ago. And yeah. wind and solar can't make anything. And Stu, the interesting thing about wind and solar is, let's go back to the light bulb. <laughs> the light bulb was made with oil. Right. And we have a lot of ways of generating electricity. We got wind and solar, natural gas, coal, nuclear, hydro. All six of those generating systems cannot exist without oil because all the parts and the computers and the insulation, all the components to make the system work is made from oil. So without oil, you eliminate electricity. Electricity came after oil. And it, take a look at the other side of it too. Everything that needs electricity, everything right. that needs electricity, your iPhone, your television, the defibrillator, the x-ray machine, everything that needs electricity 
is made with those oil derivatives. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, the confusing thing, the frustrating thing is our, our leaders talk about wind and solar energy is going to replace oil. Well, it can't happen because they do different things. Wind and solar only generates electricity. Can't make any tires. Can't make any insulation. And and Ronald, I, I I've this this whole EV thing is just going hilarious. Um, the weight of the EV causes more uh, tire pollution and microplastic micro. Uh, pollution because the tires weigh uh, wear out at 75 percent less you your tires wear out that much more on evs because all the extra battery evs are polluting more than ice cars and people are not putting the second order of magnitude in here and there's and another so, another facet yeah, of evs you have to take a look at too Oh, cool. But you're not, you're burning through more tires, which is oil and everything else. And tearing up the roads. You know, I'm here in California. <laughs> you know, California, we're a big state. We got 400,000 miles of roadway. Right. And with all the fuel taxes up and down the state, it, it raises like $8.8 .8 billion to maintain 400,000 miles of roads. And now the governor wants everybody to drive an EV. Well, EVs are heavier. Right, they tear up the roads quicker, and the EVs are paying nothing to maintain the roads. And the eight point eight billion dollars in tax revenue we get out of the fuels that's going to decrease as people are driving less and less ICE cars and more EV cars. And so, yeah, the the amount of money Ooh. to fund the road repairs is going down, where the need to fund the roads oh. is going to be increasing. I mean, it's this is not even being talked about. I mean, no. this is this is like uh, so. How many billions is California over budget, or they are they're in a budget crisis right now? Uh, they're always in a budget crisis. You know, they uh, keep laying on more uh, regulations and more cost, and it's uh, wow. it's crazy. And uh, what I'm looking for is I think there's some deals that we'll probably see between China and uh, California uh, on importing more refined products since the refined products from California, the refineries are being shut down. So well, exactly, because uh, Asia is planning on building, I believe, 88 new refineries. Yep. Now, these would be state of the art and. You know, the interesting thing, when you talk about them building more refineries and us importing more, it, it brings back memories. Remember the oil embargo? You're oh, old enough. Ab yeah, I do yeah, remember. So I, yes. <laughs> in, in 73, the oil embargo hit the United States. You know, we we're pretty reliant on OPEC for oil. And OPEC decided to shut the valve. And it was devastating. People were lined up to get gas. And I mean, it, it pretty much shut down the country. In 73, the Department of Energy was formed. Their main goal, don't let this happen again. 50 years have gone by. Well, if you take a look back in 73, California was pretty much independent for, for oil. We had a lot of production in the state, right. a lot of production in Alaska. Between Alaska and California production, we provided 95% of the state of California's needs, and we relied on foreign oil for 5%. Well, 50, 50 years have gone by. We're the fourth largest economy in the world. And the 5% dependency on The state on of California is the fourth largest cal uh, economy in the world. Wow. So we have uh, basically gone from 5% dependency in 73 to more than 60% dependency on foreign oil. And it's interesting because the Department of Energy has 14,000 employees has an annual budget of $48 billion. And they've allowed California, the fourth largest economy in the world, to increase our dependency on foreign oil. Stu, California's a big state. We got nine international airports in the state. Right. We got 41 military airports in the state. Right. Three, three of the largest shipping ports in the world, all being run by foreign oil. Wow. 
now I did see a refinery that was getting additional money and I have to, I have to go remember what I was seeing, but it was for a renew. It was an upgraded refinery for renewable, uh, either, uh, airplane fuel. And I believe you have been singing about the airport fuel issue for a long time. I'm not sure that I want to be on a plane with renewable uh, <laughs> fuel that is not tested. <laughs> Sorry, I, you know, I kind of like tested methods when I'm in the air, right? No, it's 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 bizarre that, that no one's uh, you know talking about this. It's 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 crazy. I, I I'm just amazed that the world is is buying into all this green movement, and it's a uh, it's pathetic think, for what's happening around the world. Well, Ronald, it, it, it's about delivering the lowest kilowatt per hour to everyone on the planet with the least amount of impact on the environment. Let, if we did that, we'd all be running down the road happy. But you got to use nuclear. You got to use natural gas. You got to use oil. Hey, wind and solar have their place. I'm all in. Let's use them. But let's use them fiscally responsible. Um, I've well, been Stu, putting... you also have to, take, you have to take a look at the quality of the electricity because exactly. the, currently the four systems we have primarily, be it coal, natural gas, hydro, and nuclear, they provide continuous, uninterruptible electricity. Exactly. Where wind and solar provides occasional electricity, depending right. on the weather. If you're in the operating room, you don't want the lights to go out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And, you know, we, we got data Oops. centers, we got computers, we got airports, the military. They need continuous electricity, not intermittent electricity. And it, it's interesting that most of the states are buying into where we're going to close the natural gas power plants, we're going to close the coal power plants, yep. we're going to close the nuclear power plants, all with continuous electricity, and we're going to replace it with wind and solar. New York is just absolutely unbelievably weird i vote right now let's take a poll after this then go <laughs> all those in favor of letting new york be our test pilot ban all diesel all gasoline anything delivered with gasoline or diesel shut down all oil out of new york all those in favor uh let's let it be a good test run the stock market would well Stock market probably wouldn't be affected because no one would be able to get to the stock market. <laughs> it, it, most of that's automated now anyway. In Texas, Ronald, uh, last month or month before, got more financial uh, jobs than did uh, New York. So the, the most number of the Wall Street guys are now in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, anyway, that, that's a whole nother story. But wouldn't but that be a fun? Uh, <laughs> what was that movie with Kurt Russell all those years ago? Escape from New York. I don't that, remember that. That was I, a. It was a really uh, like a barbaric movie, and when people are trying to get out, Snake Plissken was uh, his character, and he was trying to save the president out of New York. So I, that would pretty be pretty weird. So, what I would really like the, the global elites to do is participate in conversations because, you know, we do it, that, Ronald, it, when one side doesn't want to talk. Well, they got to stop using the word energy because they misuse it. You're either talking electricity or you're talking products because wind and solar can generate electricity, right? Can't, gener can't generate products. Oil can basically generate the products, but can't make electricity. Right. So you can't, you can't, you can't mix them. And they do different things. You know, wind and solar only generates electricity and can make nothing for society. Whereas, you know, the oil makes no electricity, but makes all the products. And, you know, I was interviewed in New York um, a couple weeks ago. And the first question to me, What's wrong? We understand you're pro oil. I said, "Whoa, I'm not pro oil. I'm pro the products we get from oil, <laughs> but not pro oil. We've had 200 years to replace oil, and have been unable to do it. And you can't replace it with wind and solar because they don't do what you're getting out of oil. Yeah. And so, 
you know, it's a materialistic society. You know, I'm all for improving efficiencies and conservation because Stu, you know, what we have on this earth, yeah, there's a lot of oil. Pretty much every country has oil. Very few countries have the exotic minerals and metals that are going green, like right. lithium and cobalt. That's much more limited in availability. And so, yeah, they, you know, when the earth was formed billions of years ago, there's, you know, there's coal and there's oil and right. all the lithium and cobalt. You know, is it going to be around 100 years from now? Yes. 1,000 years from now? Probably yes. 10,000? You know, I, I'm not sure, you know, because yeah. what we have on this earth, we want to conserve it. We got a great life. And of the 8 billion people on this planet, it's devastating that more than 80%, and that's more than 6 billion people, they're living on less than $10 a day. Right. They haven't enjoyed the Industrial Revolution. We have a great life, and we can afford to do all these crazy things. Did you, see the, most, did you see the interview with the president of Guyana when he was being attacked by the BBC reporter just recently? That was a hoot. He defend. He goes, we've got more uh, forests and we export And the guys. The reporter says, well, you're responsible for all these exports of oil. And he says, you can't blame that on us. We export the oil, but we have so much in forests that we absorb 18 times what is exported out. That's your fault. I thought it was a great argument. Let's let Africa use their own resources and not say that they only can use wind and solar. Anyway, sorry. I thought it was great. Yeah. I've got World leaders article. need to defend themselves. Yeah. I've got an article coming out, I think, next week that uh, basically it's humanity's demands for the products. Right. That's determining the supply of oil. Huh. You know, basically, stop using the product. Stop using the fuel. The need for oil goes away. Have you got a title for the uh, article yet? Mandating social changes to, to achieve net zero emissions. I can't wait game. to read that one. I cannot it's a, wait. It's a fool's game. The world demand, you know, we basically, remember Greta Thunberg when she was chastising the leaders of the world. How dare you? Oh, I, yeah. I, I rephrased that. It's kind of like, how dare me demand all these products and fuels and then, you know, so I can improve my life. How dare me so I can demand all of these products, but how dare you to hold those products from me? Right. Basically, we're, we're demanding these, these products and fuels, which right. is in, increasing the supply. And then we're claiming the suppliers are causing climate change. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, um, so, and, and Greta, uh, she is a pawn. I feel sorry for her in many ways that she is just being used by people as a puppet, as a front person, if you would. Exactly. And like I say, there, there's no conversations because, you know, she, you know, when she flies everywhere, you know, she's flying in these electric planes and <laughs> oh. you know i got really tickled when she was being hauled off to jail uh in a photo op um uh, was it last year i can't ronald i can't remember when it was but she was being hauled off at a uh, coal factory that she a coal mine that she was there to try to help shut down and then uh, about four months later they started tearing down the wind farm so they could reopen that coal 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 mine because germany is in such trouble so if you're going to get hauled off to jail be careful what you're standing for <laughs> <laughs> i don't get it but it, it is crazy but like you say it, it you know we're, we're blaming, you know, the fossil fuel industry for climate change, but they don't exist. They, they don't make anything that we need. We need something and we're forcing them to make it. And, and BASF has made so much. They're a big fertilizer. They've had to move out of Germany, but they need natural gas, which is a great byproduct of an oil <laughs> and gas well. Oh, oil and gas so fertilizer is kind of important for food 
you know. Well, exactly. You, you want to get rid of natural gas. Well, you're going to start getting rid of fertilizers. You're going to start getting rid of pesticides, which helps the food industry grow a lot of products. So it's, you know, we're, we're kind of like blindsided that we like our life, but, you know. Right. Now, um, coal, I'm all in on using better technology and using less coal, but I'll tell you what, um, there's no way we would have a stable grid without coal right now. Oh, yeah, exactly. exactly. We've got to maintain our coal. Well, we have to maintain continuous generated electricity. Right. And right now, there's, there's only four methods that which, you know, coal, natural gas, hydro, and nuclear. And, you know, the fact that they want to get rid of three of them, coal, natural gas, and nuclear. Right. And replace it with wind and solar. I mean, I, well, Ronald, I, I am excited about geothermal. And there is a lot of new technology coming around for geothermal. And I think geothermal has the potential. But can it scale quickly? Uh, I, I'm not seeing that technology scale but the oil and gas EMP operators that can migrate over to a geothermal solution, that tech, the guys are already there. I mean, it's already the workforce is there and the oil field service guys can run down the road with it. But just seeing how that all plays uh, in now, different areas, Yellowstone, man, you could tap into it easy. Well, Stu, you're right. There, there's no silver bullet answer. And, uh, you know, there, there's place for almost everything. And the challenge when you come up with a solution, right. can you com- can you commercialize it? Because yep. you can run a you can run a car on French fry grease. Yep. But there aren't enough people eating that many French fries to generate that much grease. <laughs> you know, so you yep. can't commercialize. So it's there are places because I know like EVs. I live in Southern California, and <clears throat> interest we have a temperate climate. So does Florida, and. California has about 40% of all the EVs in the entire country are here in California. 40%. Yeah. And most of them are low mileage cars. They, you know, they, they basically sit in the garage and they do the short hauls. But if you want to go somewhere and bring out the workhorse vehicle, right. you know, let, let's take a look at gasoline consumption. Right. Gasoline consumption hit a peak in 2019 worldwide. And that was before the pandemic. Right. Since 2019, we now have 30 million EVs in the entire world. And we have hundreds of millions of people not going to work as often because they're telecommuting. Right. And so we got hundreds of millions of people not going to work as often, driving as much. Right. And we have 30 million EVs that are not burning, you know, gasoline. And in 2023, the world hit another peak. Of oil. <laughs> because I mean, I was, EVs, Ronald, I was expecting you to say, we didn't get in, but we'd get another peak. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, it's people, if people want to go somewhere, they bring out the workhorse vehicle. And yes. it's, it, it's amazing that, you know, I, I preached, uh, I wrote an article, well, I think two years ago that the auto industry has been mandated into a death spiral to make yes. EVs because when you take a look at the profile of the EV owner, the highly educated, high income, multi car family, low mileage requirements. Right. Most of the public is not as highly educated, not as highly compensated, may not be a multi car family, may not live in a house, may live in an apartment. Right. And you know, today, you know, most people have a debt of like sixty to hundred thousand dollars with car loans and credit cards and you know mortgages yep. and et cetera, et cetera. And very few people, ironically, have financial literacy and they're living right. paycheck to paycheck. And so they're kind of like one paycheck away from being homeless. Oh, and yeah. once once you get off the income stream, you're you're hurting. And so most people, you know, can't afford a luxury EV, and right. uh, yeah, so it's 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 hitting the fan. And what's your I, what's your thoughts on the China invasion, if you would, of the plants that they're putting in 
uh, China has got, uh, you know, pretty far along on a plant in Mexico. They've got just tons of Chinese folks not buying EVs, and they're going to be offloading that inventory to the U.S. and the U.K. And do you see those being the infiltrating of our market, the low-cost ones? Well, definitely. You know, from the oil embargo we had in 73, you know, we had OPEC. We are dependent on OPEC yeah. for oil. Now we're dependent on China and India for low-cost products. Yep. And these countries have no environmental controls, no labor controls. That's why Todd Royal and I wrote that book, Clean Energy Exploitations, because all the exotic minerals and metals to go green are coming from these developing countries. And, you know, I, I get off and ask, will you buy an EV? I said, definitely not. And they say, why? I said, for ethical and moral reasons. Yep. And they said, what the hell do you mean by that? They said, I know where the lithium and cobalt's coming from, and I'm not willing to financially support that. Our government is, however, our government provides incentives to buy EVs, you know, yep. subsidized, you know, building wind turbines, solar panels. They're basically encouraging China and Africa and parts of Brazil continue exploiting the people who have yellow, brown, and black skin. Continue the environmental degradation on your land. We're going green. And I think wow. it's, it's hypocritical, but there's no discussions. You know, I'll tell you, I've learned more about solar power from trying to get my houses set up for um, grid failure. And so I have um, several propane generators uh, since I live so far out in the country that don't have natural gas. So I've got big propane tanks and a backup generators, but you can't run propane all the time, you know, for unbelievable amounts of time so i put solar panels so the house design that i've got for each of the four houses is to have batteries that will support lights tvs and you know my office gear and everything else uh for the day or and or just rely on generators to charge those batteries for four hours a day so if i can just run a, a generator for four hours a day i don't need much electricity now I tried to supplement that with solar panels and some wind turbines. They stink. Holy smokes, Batman. That I've been putting these things in and it's like, okay, somebody was kind of going, uh, now you bought all these solar panels. And I'm like, yeah. And I, I was, uh, and they go, did you buy them from China? And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> I, here I am a hypocrite. I, I'm trying to learn how well, to put in solar. Well, it's kind of like who the, else makes them? You know? <laughs> I don't know. And I and so now I'm trying to replace a couple of them. And all this is so that I can be off the grid if the grid comes down. We're being warned by um, um, the FBI, the head, uh, Christopher Ray, when he said this past week, the grid is in danger uh the chinese could hack in anybody could hack in and we've got all these renewables the grit the, here's the head of the fbi saying this it's not even me that's so, right wow. I, I think I, i'd like to see a cartoon of Stu turley driving his ev right. towing his diesel generator behind him <laughs> you know what that ain't gonna happen now, i do want i do love elon musk and uh I love what he's doing with Twitter. Uh, I am buying a uh, Starlink system because uh, I do want to be able to have the backup internet to go to his his internet. If he comes out with a phone, I'm going to get rid of my iPhone. Now, am I going to buy a uh, car? No, I'm probably not. <laughs> now, if I had the money to throw away, I might buy a cyber truck for a video. And then take the write off on the taxes and then park it. <laughs> <laughs> or use the cyber truck to go on meetings for folks because it is bulletproof. And if people see me, you know, I, I just have to make sure I'm in a bulletproof car. My my neighbor just bought an EV truck. And, oh, did uh, he really? What he was a, he, Tesla. Tesla. Oh. Yeah. And uh, I, he was on the driveway, so I walked over and he showed me the truck and he was pretty proud of it. And Stu, I, I, I thought it was ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Ronald, have you seen on the videos on YouTube, it's a carrot and a cucumber test on the cyber truck. 
people go back in and then they shut the hatch in the back and they put the carrot and or the cucumber in there and it cuts them it cuts them in half and then they go to another <laughs> suv and they put it down and you put a cucumber or a, a carrot in there and the gate will come back up so the moral <laughs> of the story is a cyber truck may be taking your finger off <laughs> i'm like ah that's kind of scary now um has what's his real world uh has he had it long enough to be able to say it's actually been working he has limited range um basically like everybody else has an ev they know how far they can go and then come back and then charge it overnight because waiting for the charging station that's hours wasted so most people really don't like to charge at a charging station conveniently you come home, plug it in, and you know, next morning you're ready to go. But oh, yeah. it's yeah, he, he has a range that fits his needs. And wow, he's, he's, a, he's a Tesla lover, he has a Tesla sedan, and got himself a Tesla truck. <laughs> I well, I more power to him, and I think that's one of the reasons Tesla will survive. I believe in Elon. And other people believe in Elon as well. Now, whether or not I want to buy it, I don't want to have the those children digging all that cobalt, you know, on my hands as I'm a hypocrite buying China, you know, solar panels from China. And I'm just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, but, just like the oil embargo we had, you know, with OPEC, dependence right. on OPEC, we are growing our dependency on China and India. Oh, and man. primarily... If, because they're more cost effective. Because you know, I, I'm here in California, the regulations here are crazy. And Newsom, you know, we're the most regulated location in the world. If you want to manufacture anything, you want to do it in California to have the minimum amount of emissions. But I'm I'm convinced that Newsom doesn't breathe air outside California borders. He wants to clean California up, which is fine. But he's leaking, I use the term leaking, leaking responsibility for manufacturing somewhere else that doesn't have the environmental controls because he doesn't breathe their emissions. <laughs> he only breathes emissions within the state of California. And so, yeah, he's basically increasing emissions, but because it's so cost effective to do it there, that's the only way we can get affordable products into California. Make wow. them in China, make them in India you know, exploit their people, you know, destroy their land. You know, India is going through a huge uh, growth period right now because the people are afraid of China in, in many ways in, in there. So the low cost manufacturing is moving to China. I mean, moving to uh, India. And uh, it's just unbelievable what's going on with all that. Yeah, you know, when you think about it, you know, more than 6 billion people making less than $10 a day, that's that's atrocious. In fact, the the cover of the book of Clean Energy Exploitations, yep. you know, we we debated before we chose it, but yep. that's a photograph from Africa with yep. a military guy with an Uzi yep. overlooking the family mining this stuff by hand so we can go green. That's pretty frightening. Yeah, and that's that's the exploitations. And like I say, I, I don't want to encourage that. And I think people should be aware of it. Right. And if you're happy with that, you know, fine. You know, yeah. people say I'm a hypocrite because I got an iPhone because you know, it's got a lithium battery. Right. Um, but the lithium battery in there, I could probably make a million iPhones. You know, exactly, yes. <laughs> compared to one battery. But, you know, even if we went to uh, Ronald uh, hybrids, I'm a big hybrid fan. And I think Toyota has done a phenomenal job not going all in on the EVs. And the hybrid makes sense to me to really get you further down the road, get 50, 60 miles per gallon um, and go with a hybrid. I I'm all in on that. But can it tow my boat? No. <laughs> Can it pull my trailer for working on my land? No. Well, Stu, I, I'm an engineer. And right, I thought the hybrid was the most fantastic thing because right. you, you double your gas mileage. Yep. And, and you buy hundreds of years to develop battery technology. Exactly. And But the auto industry has been mandated to get their emissions down so low for their entire fleet 
that the only way to get down that low, they had to eliminate the gasoline engine in the hybrid. So most automobile manufacturers are 100% into EVs. Wow. You're going to see a couple hybrids, but for them to meet the regulations right. of the emissions of their you know average out among their entire fleet, they had to eliminate the gasoline engine and the hybrid. I did but not know that. I, I, I think, I think you're mandating 100% hybrids, that'd be great. Yeah. Like I said, you know, you're doubling your gas mileage and you, know, you, you buy hundreds of years to develop the battery technology. But you see, in, and we nailed it in the, the poorer families, if they made the hybrids affordable for the poorer families or the uh, ones that a hybrid will get you there. The poor folks in, in Chicago this past winter, I saw a snowstorm and there were lines and lines of people waiting in snow to charge their cars. And then they wouldn't start when they would get there to even get them charged. Nobody could go to work in a snowstorm. It was. Well, you know, the tough thing about EVs is if you live in cold climate, you want your heater to work. Well, Stu, the heater works off the battery. <laughs> if you're in the desert and it's 120 degrees, you want your air conditioning running. Well, Stu, the AC runs off the battery. Yeah, rut <laughs> so, And so that's why the temperate climates of California and Florida have most of the EVs in the entire country. Wow. We don't have the extreme cold. We don't have the extreme heat. And it's, like I say, I, the rest of the country doesn't really care about the EVs. <laughs> no. Uh, in, in fact, this is just a personal note from my father-in-law. Um, my father-in-law was on a, uh, a trip to Midland, uh, Odessa in, in Midwest, in mid and West Texas. And um, he got there late and he found a hotel room and they did not have a charger anywhere nearby. So he had to go drive to a different place, leave his car overnight, charge it, walk a mile and a half or two miles back to his hotel room. And he's 85. And then he had to walk back a mile and a half, two miles back to his car in the morning. And guys don't really need to be doing that at that age at dark in the middle. Now it is Midland Odessa. So it is a, <laughs> not a bad place because there's good people out there but you know what i'm now, saying the, the, the question i have for him would he buy another ev no <laughs> <laughs> he loved now i will say this as a tesla he loves his tesla absolutely it's a way cool car i'm all in i'm happy and he and 99 of the time he just happened to take the this trip to west texas he won't be taking it on the road again. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a little different when I would, I would not want to have to get in the car and go save my grand, my uh, father-in-law, but I would do that in a heartbeat. But I, uh, you know, this is like, what happens if he had gotten hurt? Cause he had to go to a battery charger. Exactly. Yes. Uh, I, 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 it's just battery chargers are not out there unless you're in a big city. <laughs> well, the other thing is that they provide uh, incentives to build battery chargers, but there's no incentives to maintain them. Ooh. And so a lot of the battery chargers, once they're built and they become inoperative, yep. sometimes they remain inoperative for a long time. Um, BP just announced, I believe it was yesterday or day before, Ronald, that they are getting rid of their, um, excuse me, their charging station division group and they're laying everybody off because they were expecting to be building fleet places for charging stations rather than onesie twosies and um if bp is you have total energies or total energies however you want to phrase it is now going uh, all in on buying all the natural gas plants in texas you have Shell, who's now thinking about getting out of the UK and coming to the US. I mean, they were, there's that rumor going on because they don't like the regulatory issues going on in the UK. And they're doing more development and more expansion. I think that we're going to see some more headway trouble for the EVs because of insurance companies. 
I think insurance is the hidden like nugget in there that people can't afford the two and three times the insurance rates that are coming. Well, you talk about insurance on EVs because the EV battery, once it, it's easy to start on fire. And once it starts on fire, it's a chemical fire. And you can't put it out with water. Are you no, they're, they're horrible. In fact, I think in Germany, there's, uh, there's some of the cities in Germany have banned parking EVs in underground structures. Right. Because if it starts on fire, they can't get to it. It could burn down the whole building. And we've seen those those uh, uh, videos of the uh, transport Tankers. carriers uh, yeah. and the big offshore carriers just burn into the ground. Yeah, there was one that went down. It had four thousand cars. It had inexpensive cars, so Maseratis, Bentleys, you know, oh. <laughs> and to the bottom of the ocean. Now, consider yourself Lloyd's of London. You're not going to be too excited about insuring the next transporting ship. Exactly. Yep, because it has the potential of you know starting fire but starts fire in the middle of the ocean and you know you can't put it out with water no and it, it could just burn down the whole ship you know so, and and i think ronald the discussion we would be having right now is we're not against evs we're not against an energy transition the technology is not here now exactly. uh, i mean and so the, how do we get to that technology and everything else is have discussions right exactly and you know battery <laughs> technology well, you take a look at the, you know, the, the handheld phone, you know, the first phone weighed a pound. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I the, had one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, the, you know, the battery technology, the batteries got less and less. The, yep. the challenge with commercializing it into a vehicle, now you got thousands of pounds to move. You know, right. it's easy to, easy to charge a little phone, but now you want, you know, you need battery technology. And there's a lot of battery technology okay, evolving. Okay, this one. This one just chapped me up, Ronald. Okay. I am in uh, Dallas, Texas. Okay. I'm, I'm in uh, Dallas last, uh, last week. And I look over at my phone and it's late at night and I plugged in my phone and it says your phone is on green energy charging and won't be ready until 7 a.m. the next morning. And I'm like, all right, I'm not buying this. So I go over and I look at ERCOT, what is going on on the grid, and there's no battery coming in from wind or solar. It was night. It was, and so why is my iPhone telling me that it's not charging because there's no green energy? I'm like, mm. so I tested it. I plugged it into my solar here at the house, and it said... Yeah, we're going to wait until two or three o'clock tomorrow in order to charge because it's, um, you know, we're waiting for green energy. You're on a solar panel. <laughs> what kind of marketing boo hockey is this, man? This is like, I know I'm on a solar panel because I'm sitting there looking at that solar panel and I'm off the grid. Well, you know, we've learned very little. You know, Germany was the first country to go green. <laughs> and today... And they, they well, California is a whole different country too, isn't it? Well, that's that's a different <laughs> subject. <laughs> but Germany's got the most expensive electricity in the world, <laughs> and California's right behind them. <laughs> yeah, and so is New York and Connecticut. I think I, some are three top top ones. Yep, yep, yeah. We're uh, <laughs> we're we're a comical uh, case for the entire country. Have you seen that message though on your phone in California? That it's not no. charging uh, because no, of the renewables. We don't have that many renewables in the grid yet. It's it's interesting. We, we <laughs> California because, because you know, we're the fourth largest economy in the world, and shutting down our power supplies. We shut down the San Onofre uh, nuclear power, power plant, and we're shutting down gas and natural, you know, coal, yeah. and California imports more electricity than any other state in the country wow from our joining neighbors right now hopefully they have extra electricity to give us because we have the demand they have the supply right <laughs> and if they need it we ain't gonna get it <laughs> no um 
Wow. <laughs> now, that's funny. I, if there's any of our podcast listeners, uh, if anybody else has had that same thing happen, I'd sure love to know. Cause that really drives me nuts when I know that I am on a solar panel and it is green energy and my phone still pops up and says, we're not going to charge because you're not on green energy. And I'm like, mm -hmm. that's a marketing scam is what that is. <laughs> Uh, Maybe you didn't you didn't register your solar panels. <laughs> oh snap. Or they recognize well, yeah, there you go. They didn't I didn't register my solar panels. So not only are we gonna have to register to even get uh never mind. Okay, that's a whole different story. But uh Ronald, how can people find you, right? Uh I know we're gonna have your book um uh in the show notes, but how do people uh find all your articles and everything else? You know, the best thing is just Ronald Stein, Google me. I'm all over the internet. Um, like you say, I'm on America Outline News. I'm a basically a contributor weekly, and my articles go out there. But American Outlaw News, just say Ronald Stein and okay. pick a location. You could pick, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, any of the articles you have, but you, you'll right. you'll see my articles pop up, and uh, Sounds yeah, fantastic. so it's kind All of right. hard for me, hard for me to hide from anybody. <laughs> yeah, and that's why I need a uh, a Tesla uh, cyber truck because it's bulletproof. <laughs> that's right. And so when you, you and I go to lunch sometime. I'm going to have to you know show up in a cyber truck so people don't be, shoot us. Be so. protected. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for stopping by the podcast, Ronald. I do appreciate. Stu, you have time. a great day. Hey, talk to you soon.